the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hi, this is Rob Benedict. And I am Richard Spate. We were both on a little show you might know called Supernatural. It had a pretty good run. 15 seasons, 327 episodes. And though we have seen, of course, every episode many times, we figured, hey, now that we're wrapped, let's watch it all again. And we can't do that alone. So we're inviting the cast and crew that made the show along for the ride. We've got writers, producers, composers, directors, and we'll of course have some actors on as well, including some certain guys that played some certain pretty iconic brothers. It was kind of a little bit of a left field choice in the best way possible. The note from Kripke was, he's great, we love him, but we're looking for like a really intelligent Duchovny type. With 15 seasons to explore, it's going to be the road trip of several lifetimes. So please join us and subscribe to Supernatural then and now. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History of Feminist Women's History Comedy Podcast. I'm your host, Anne Foster, and today we are revisiting. Season one, episode six. So over the past few weeks, I've been re-releasing all the episodes from season one, which was six episodes long. Can you imagine? Can you imagine me doing a six episode season at this point? I mean, no spoilers, but the next season I'm working on (laughs) is going to be at least 20 episodes long, each one an hour and a half. But I'll give you some clues as to what that's about afterwards. Anyway, today we are looking at the episode about Lucy Percy Hay who was a lady spy, which is to me the coolest kind of spy. Because I like I like the whole thing about like a s- underestimated, like women in a society where they're underestimated using that against people so they can like do sneaky things. It's just, it's a vibe. It's a, it's a trope, if you can call like actual people and what they did a trope. One of my favorite things. So the reason I'm re-releasing this in the previous five episodes has been because season one came out of the gate, like I wouldn't be where I am in the podcast without those episodes, but uh, the audio quality was not as good as it later became. And so this is a way to remind you of where we started and also just to make these episodes maybe a bit more enjoyable to listen to. And what's interesting specifically about this episode, I was looking back through my notes just to remind myself about when and where this all took place. And it's like, oh my gosh, there's so much overlap with episodes we later did and stuff that we talked about in so much more detail. Like she was around the court of James the first slash six, the son of Mary Queen of Scots, who, you know, Anne of Denmark was there. Like, and then she got involved, like when she's a lady spy, when she's doing her spy shit, that's because she was working on behalf of Charles, like hot King Charles the second, my shameful crush. 
So it's just interesting to see, like, this is my first episode I did set in this time period. We've done so much more later. So it's really like coloring in the experience, I think, to listen to this, knowing what we know now. Also, I had forgotten that George Villiers is involved in the story. George Villiers, who I'm not sure what the release date is, but there's that new Julianne Moore series coming to stars called Mary and George, which is about the two of them. She's the mom. And then George Villiers is her son. And about how she sort of like pimps him out to James, King James, and how maybe they then murder King James. Like in this episode, I say like, oh, and then James died. And then here's what George Villiers did. But this is um, the TV show suggesting like, what if George killed him? So anyway, George Villiers is part of this story. I did a whole So This Asshole about him as well. I did an interview on a podcast ages ago where one of the questions the host asked me was, what's one of my episodes that I feel like is maybe under discussed or um, that I feel like could, you know, I feel like it's more interesting than the amount of feedback I've gotten about it or whatever. And I said this one, and I still think that because, you know, there's flashier things like Mary Toft or whatever. Lucy Hay's story, I think, is really cool and really interesting. And I first came across it because she's a descendant of the Boleyn family. And there's just like every, in every generation, someone of the Boleyn family, it was just like the it girl at royal court. Also, not to mention the fact that she was kind of mentored by tits out Frances Howard, the first one. Anyway, it's a story with so many connections to so many other things. Like one day, somebody might choose to listen to all these like British history episodes of vulgar history in chronological order to see like who was around when who else was around. I have sort of a spreadsheet, but it gets convoluted. Anyway, Lucy Percy Hay. I love this story. I love to shine a spotlight on it again. And so I hope you enjoy listening again for the first time to the story of this, my favorite, Renaissance era, Lady Spy. Hello, my name is Anne Foster, and this is the Vulgar History Podcast. This is a feminist women's history comedy slash storytelling podcast. And today I'm really excited about the woman who I'm going to talk to you about, not just because there's going to be an unexpected crossover moment with a previous person who we've talked about on this podcast, but just because this is a woman who so much exemplifies what we've been looking at all season long, which has been the phrase that's become an aphorism really, which is that well-behaved women seldom make history which is, as I've discussed in the other podcasts, but maybe you haven't heard them or just you, you could use a reminder. The historian, Dr. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich said this statement in a paper she was writing about Puritan burial rituals or something like that in the 1970s. And instantaneously, it became just sort of a catchphrase for women's history in general. And what she was saying, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, is basically there's been so many people throughout all of history all different genders who we don't know about for various reasons because of their marginalizations, um, because of who is in power and who is writing things down. But in the, the Western canon of history, which is what I've been researching mostly to this point, women show up far less than men do. And that is because it was societally the expectation that women would be quote unquote well-behaved and just kind of stay at home and run the household, which was a big job. And people knew it was a big job and you got trained up to do it. That's what you're doing if you were a rich and powerful woman. And if you were a less powerful woman, then you were just working all the time and raising children. And basically to be a good woman in this time and place and the time and place we're looking at today is 17th century England meant that the greatest thing you could do is for no one to write about you when you were alive and for no one to write about you after you had died because you were just like so well behaved. You didn't make a ripple in anything, which means that the women who we know about tend to be the ones who did not behave. I mean, quote unquote, behave, which is what we've been looking at for the past five episodes and for today's episode as well. And we are going to be talking about a woman who was born Lucy Percy who got married, and then she became known as Lucy Hay, the Countess of Carlisle. And she was a spy, not just a spy, a lady spy. What is the distinction I'm making there between the word spy and lady spy? Nothing really other than just to say that I think it's worth noting that she was a spy who was a woman. We tend to hear a lot more about man spies, and I'm happy to talk about a lady spy. She was also literally a lady, with the whole family pedigree, etc. And 
I'm so excited to do this as a podcast, especially there's several moments here that are going to cross over with characters who we know from previous episodes of this podcast slash people from history in what I'm starting to think of as like the Tudor slash Stuart England expanded cinematic universe. I'm so excited when two people or more than two people suddenly reoccur in other people's stories. I'm like, they were alive at the same time and place. Mind blowing to me. And there's some great moments like that in her story because she really bridges a bunch of eras that we've looked at a bit so far in this podcast. And she's just sort of like on the forefront being amazing throughout all of it. One of the things that strikes me about the story of Lucy Percy Hay is that she was really just like the right person born at the right time to do so much interesting, amazing stuff. To her, she might think like, ooh, this is like, you know, there's that, that other aphorism that's like, may you live in interesting times. And that's like a curse because when things are interesting, that also means it's chaotic and a mess and it's really stressful. This is where I think she was born at the right place, right time. Like, even if she was like, this is a bit much for me, like, spoiler, at one of the, one of the points where she is in the Tower of London, she might have thought like, okay, this is a bit much. But frankly, I think the amount of chaos surrounding her was like perfect because it allowed her to just thrive in this amazing way. So to really set the scene of what she was born into, we need to go back ways to an incident that I am not going to get into in any great detail, but it's the gunpowder plot. So the gunpowder plot was a thing that happened in 1605. And just to be super quick about it, because this isn't, this is just some background. This isn't the actual story of Lucy, but it's important background stuff. Effectively, a group of people involving a person named Guy Fox decided that they wanted to explode the houses of parliament and kill the king. And the king at the time was James I, James I being the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. And so what the gunpowder treason plot people wanted to do is to blow him up because they didn't want him to be king anymore. They didn't like him. They also planned to kill his son, the Prince of Wales, who's going to be the next king, which was Prince Henry. And then their plan was to take James's nine-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, and make her the new queen. But she would be like a puppet and the conspirators would sort of be the ones in charge in a parliamentary sort of setting. And they chose... Elizabeth, who was nine years old, despite the fact that there was also a younger son. So they wanted to get rid of Prince Henry because they thought he would probably fight back too much. He wouldn't be a good puppet. Choose the younger brother, even though usually, you know, in this situation, boys became kings before girls became queens. Because little baby Charles was just a little toddler who just learned how to walk. And because Elizabeth, who 100% I'm going to do an episode about at some point later in the future, was just like really poised and had already done some events where everyone was like impressed with how much she seemed like a little mini queen, even though she was nine years old. The plan didn't work. They did not explode the Houses of Parliament. All the people who were involved were arrested and mostly executed. And one of the conspirators who was implicated but not killed was the father of Lucy Percy, who was a man named Henry Percy, the ninth Earl of Northumberland. So his thing is, he's got a lot of things going on. Firstly, he was known as the Wizard Earl because he did a lot of science experiments and was just a weirdo. So Dorothy and Lucy were both already born when the whole gunpowder scenario happened. Lucy who's our main character today. So she was born probably around 1600, so like five years before the gunpowder plot. She has a slightly older sister, Dorothy, who was born probably a year or two earlier. And I mentioned Dorothy as well, because the two girls were, they weren't twins, but they were so close in age and their lives were really, really connected all the time. And there really is sort of like Jessica Elizabeth Wakefield situation where Dorothy was very much the sort of like quiet, nice person who kind of the well-behaved and Lucy was just sort of like this 17th century Jessica Wakefield type person who I'm so excited to tell you about. 
But basically, there were these two girls. They also had two younger brothers whose names were Algernon and Henry. But basically, in the year 1605, gunpowder plot happened their father was involved in it but the thing is that he wasn't directly involved in it so he knew he was charged with knowing about it and not notifying the authorities but not of actually having done anything so he wasn't executed instead he was sent to live in the tower of london where he was put in jail for 16 years and he was really rich this is a sort of situation where we've had a couple people like this in the podcast before, where you're a rich person and you're in the Tower of London. It's not like, oh no, I'm in a jail cell and this is miserable and horrible. It's more like, okay, I'm rich, I'm in the Tower of London. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay off all the guards. I'm going to build this all up so it'll be like this luxury apartment for myself. I'm going to have servants. I get to go stroll around the grounds every day. And he's the wizard earl, so he's like also doing his science experiments, etc., so this is the situation. He's off being the Tower of London, just kind of, I don't know, like living his best life. Meanwhile, his four children, so the two daughters, Lucy and Dorothy, and their brothers, Algernon and Henry, are off sort of, you know, being raised by effectively a single mother. Their mother's name, also Dorothy. Oh, side note. So their mother is Dorothy Devereaux, who I need to, just so we get the lineage straight here, was the daughter of Latisse Knowles, great grand nieces of Anne Boleyn. And so there's some, this family, just like every family, sort of like, again, to take it back to Sweet Valley High. If you've read or are familiar with the Sweet Valley High sagas, which are these amazing books I loved when I was a kid, I recommend them heartily to you now. I'll put a link in the show notes. But basically there are books about how Every generation, there are basically these two twins who are sort of like Jessica and Elizabeth. And it's like, what were they like in the Roaring Twenties? What were they like during the Great Fire of San Francisco? Just every generation, the same situations kept coming up time after time, and they kept not working out right, or whatever. Sometimes they did. In the Anne Boleyn family lineage, it's like every generation, there was some sort of Anne Boleyn type person who was just like, amazing and took the world by storm. And in this generation, that person was Lucy. So her father is in jail. Lucy and her siblings are just kind of being raised basically free range, which was the style at the time. If you were rich, you just sort of like let your children, they go to classes and stuff, but their mother wasn't like hands on with them or whatever. And also the thing is that her parents did not like each other very much because the wizard Earl was, as it turns out, a nightmare person. And so his wife, Dorothy, she was kind of better off without him, basically. Like she half-heartedly would sometimes like write some appeals to the to the monarch being like, uh, can you maybe let him out of jail or whatever? But she didn't, she was kind of better off without him. The two of them were were just sort of really the situation worked well for them, basically. And so Lucy and Dorothy would go to visit their father sometimes in the Tower of London slash his luxury apartments he had made for himself there. And this is kind of what was going on in the world for the first part of everybody's lives. So the thing is that Lucy and Dorothy were sent to court to be, uh, you know, presented as young, eligible young women. And the thing is, they were both gorgeous. Like sometimes you hear that about people from history and you look up their portraits and without the context of their personality or their charisma, you're like, okay, sure. But like with Lucy and Dorothy, especially with Lucy, you're just like, oh man, like she is gorgeous. And so she totally took everybody by storm. They're all just like, who is this woman? She's amazing. She's 18 years old. We all adore her. She was like immediately sort of the queen bee. And she fell in love with a man whose name was James Hay, who is older than her but was also like super stylish. He was like, he would wear the most interesting outfits. And this was a time when both men and women just wore like huge balloon sleeves, like lots of colorful things. He was just this fashion plate, like super popular guy. She was this gorgeous 18 year old woman and they fell in love and she decided she wanted to get married. And her mother was like, sure, whatever, because whatever, but she needed to get her father's permission. So Meanwhile, Dorothy also had a man who she wanted to marry. Both, no, I think Dorothy actually had married someone. So Lucy and Dorothy went to their father to just be like, surprise. And the wizard Earl was not a fan of what was going on. 
I mean, Dorothy had already gotten married, so he couldn't really do anything about that. But Lucy, he was just like, Ugh, I don't want her to marry a Scottish person because he was racist against Scottish people. There's a quote where he said, I cannot endure that my daughter should dance any Scottish jig. And also he just didn't like her choosing her own husband, etc. So while they were visiting, he's like, great, Dorothy, can you just like step outside for a minute? And Dorothy did. And then the wizard Earl was like, ha ha. And then he just like grabbed Lucy and kept her and made her stay with him in the Tower of London. Sort of a prisoner. She hadn't been arrested for anything, but basically he just wouldn't let her leave. And he was bribing all of the guards. And so she was basically trapped there with him. But get ready for this. Because do you know who else was in the Tower of London at this exact same time? was Francis Howard. Tits out Francis Howard, yes, from episode two of this very podcast, the uh, confessed murderess, the woman who faked her hymen virginity test when she was trying to get, extricate herself from this marriage she didn't want to be in anymore, the woman who assembled a team of like six people to murder a man who were getting in the way of her marrying another man, Francis Howard, necklines to her waist. She's in the Tower of London at the same time. When I read that, I was just like, what is happening? So the Wizard Earl is in the Tower of London being rich. Francis Howard, also in the Tower of London being rich. They're both just basically living in like luxury apartments. They're like roommate. They're not roommates. They're like neighbors in the Tower of London. And the Wizard Earl was like, you know what? Francis Howard is like such a sophisticated, gorgeous, interesting person. I like her so much. Like he would write letters to his wife being like, you know, who's great? Frances Howard, this woman who is in jail with me. She confessed to murder. I really admire her. So when Lucy was there, 18 years old, and the wizard Earl was like, okay, I really want my daughter to like stop being so headstrong and like become like a better, more fancy person. You know who she needs as a mentor is Frances Howard. He got Lucy to spend time with tits out Frances Howard because he thought Francis would be a good influence on her, which is just like, great. This is like passing of the torch from like one it girl to the next. So Francis Howard wasn't like, oh, Lucy, here's like the rules of society and here's how to be well behaved because that is not the tits out lifestyle that we know and love her for. Instead, what Francis Howard did was she was like, Lucy, why don't you come here? Like she learned about Lucy and how she wanted to marry James Hay. And so Frances Howard would invite Lucy to stay with her at her apartment in jail because it, jail apartments. And they would invite um, Lucy's boyfriend over and the two of them could like make out or whatever. And Frances Howard was like their fairy godmother. It was, oh my God, I love it. So eventually Lucy was allowed to leave jail having now learned like from Frances Howard just all the skills of how to be like the most amazing person in the world. And basically, and so Lucy left jail and she married James Hay. Ta-da. She probably danced a Scottish jig, probably screaming, screw you, dad. And instead of just being the daughter of this disgraced gunpowder plot person, she was this fancy lady. And so everybody loved her even more for this. The two of them, they wore these amazing outfits, like flamboyant, gorgeous. Her personality was written about as much as her immense beauty. She was like sassy, sarcastic, just like living it up. James Hay was like the most dapper of all the men there. Like everybody just worshiped them. At this point, uh, the king had, he really liked Lucy's husband, James Hay. And so James Hay got the job of groom of the stool, which sounds like not a great job, but in fact is a great job. Because the groom of the stool means to be, you're alone with the king, like you're the most trusted advisor. You're with the king when he's at his most vulnerable, e.g. when he's on the toilet. And so only the person who the king likes the best gets to be there. And that's where you get to talk to him and no one else is there to like have their point of view as well. The king was so pleased with James as his servant that five years after the two, after James and Lucy got married, he made James the Earl of Carlisle, which made Lucy a countess. So James was super good, um, not just at wearing amazing outfits, but also at diplomacy and politics stuff. And Lucy was just like the shining bright star of, of everything. Everybody just like worshiped and adored her because she was so smart and so witty and she was so immensely beautiful. 
literally every poet and musician she ever met decided like declared her their muse and so they all wrote poems and or painted images in tribute to her at one point uh lucy contracted smallpox and i want to mention at this point too that it seems like lucy had some ongoing medical concerns and they're the sort of things that today potentially uh physicians might not be able to say what all was going on with her but back then especially they weren't so there's some one biography i read suggested that she had like quote-unquote hypochondria which just is like like if you think you're sick if you're having symptoms like don't call it hypochondria especially with a woman like back then women women's medical concerns weren't understood at all psychological things weren't understood at all like she was clearly having some she had ongoing um, chronic illness of some sort in her life. And then at one point this turned into, or it didn't turn into, but she also got smallpox. And so she was gorgeous. She knew she was gorgeous. Being gorgeous was like a main part of her personality. And so she freaked out that she was going to lose her looks and everybody else freaked out she was going to lose her looks. And so she started wearing a mask uh, to cover while she was still healing and then she was really scared to take off the mask because she thought everyone would be grossed out by her because she might be slightly less beautiful. And so this sort of became a fashion trend, I think. Like she was wearing the mask to hide the scars and then other people started wearing masks too so she wouldn't feel weird about it. Like in that scene from Mean Girls where Katie cuts out the holes in Regina George's uh, shirt and then Regina George starts just wearing a shirt with holes and then everybody wears a shirt with holes. Like Lucy was so, she was an influencer basically. And, you know, much to the relief of all of her fans, when she finally took the mask off, guess what? Just as beautiful as before, not disfigured at all. So in 1625, which is, so Lucy herself is 25 years old now, King James I died. And if you remember from the gunpowder plot, uh, the whole thing was they wanted to kill the king and then kill his son and then make Elizabeth the queen and meanwhile, toddling around was little baby Prince Charles. But what had happened is that in the meantime here, uh, Prince Henry had died. Um, girls don't take over thrones before boys in this situation. And so the new king, unexpectedly, was Charles, who became known as Charles I. And so Charles I, so new younger king, he was a big fan of Lucy and James because everybody was because they were like the it couple of the world. He was also indebted to them because James had been part of the negotiating team that had arranged the king's, King Charles I's marriage to a French princess named Henrietta Maria. So there was an overall change of staff when it went from King James I to King Charles I. And one of the only people that carried over from one king to the other was a man named George Villiers, who was one of King James's lovers, probably like sort of his final lover after the whole Robert Carr situation ended with murder and jail. George Villiers was this. So again, it's the sort of person who um, you hear like, oh, he was so good looking. And you're like, hey, look up a portrait. And you see it's like a guy in a wig. And you're like, I guess for a guy in a wig, he looks okay. George Villiers, the first Duke of Buckingham, super handsome looking. I say that objectively because he was a horrific monster garbage person. He was um, awful. He was the worst. He was horrifying. Um, and he was a lover of King James I, allegedly. And then even though most of the other advisors sort of like were swept away, he stuck around because he had sucked up enough to King Charles I that he became King Charles I's this advisor as well. So George Villiers, the uh, Duke of Buckingham, is one of those guys. He got the title because he, the king just liked him enough. He was like, guess what? I'm giving you a title. Hooray. Everything's amazing. Okay. So he's the sort of guy, George Villiers, first Duke of Buckingham, who would be like, not just like a womanizer, but basically serial rapist situation where he would find a woman who he thought looked pretty or whatever or who he wanted or whatever and so he would go to her house and then bribe all for servants to go away and his servants would stick around and then he would basically rape her 
and then sometimes make her be his mistress was kind of his MO. This is what he did. And so Lucy Hayes' husband, James, was sent away to be like an ambassador somewhere. He was sent out of town. And while he was out of town, George Villiers was like, oh, she's like the most gorgeous, beautiful woman here. She's like amazing. And the two of them become involved. And so I don't want to necessarily say that this was against Lucy's will, but also did she consent to this? It's a big old gray area, but basically what happens is the two of them become involved for several years. Buckingham is so powerful at this point, George Villiers, AKA Buckingham. Side note, this is what makes it so challenging to me personally to read the books about this because everybody has a name, a last name, and then also a title. And you need to remember not just the person's name, but also their title. Anyway, George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, was the most powerful person other than the king, basically, because he was so slimy. Like, again, it's just like a little finger scenario. He's like a more powerful grocer. Little finger. I can't believe that in the course of doing these stories, little finger is like the least gross option. Anyway, so he convinced the king to send James Hay away so that Lucy Hay would be on her own. And then they became involved. And so this could be a situation where Lucy was like, I see how this could be good for me. And she's into it. It could be a situation where Lucy is like, well, this is happening. Might as well make the best of it. I'm not sure. But basically the two of them become involved. And because of their involvement, Lucy gets some benefits to her uh, personal life. So she became named Lady of the Bedchamber to the Queen Henrietta Maria. And this is like the woman version of Groom of the Stool. So it's basically the highest role a woman could have at court. And uh, Lucy and Henrietta Maria did not always see eye to eye, but they became quite, quite close. And so George wasn't just like doing a solid favor for this woman who he had forced to become his mistress or, or who had wanted to become his mistress. The woman who is his mistress. And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going... If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today shopify.com slash realm. Contained herein are the heresies of Radolf Buntwine, erstwhile monk turned traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Redolf Bantwine, wherever podcasts are available. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know, horrifying, right? 
Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of the podcast, Only One in the Room. Every week, my co-host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. And we're back. George basically wanted to put her there because that meant that Lucy could keep an eye on the queen and then Lucy could report back to him. So he, George, would know what was going on so he could like scheme better. But the thing is that Henrietta Maria, the queen, was like, she was no fool. She could see what was going on because part of what was going on was also that George Villiers was likely setting up Lucy to become the mistress of Charles I and Henrietta Maria didn't want that. She didn't want to be friends with a woman who's gonna, who's basically being sort of like sex trafficked to her husband. Like the whole thing is just like, if we just like see this all as like a snow globe of just everyone is terrible and sort of using each other horribly, but they're all stuck in the snow globe and you have to make do. They're all kind of doing the best they can, except for George Villiers, who's just a gross old monster. So Henrietta Maria and Lucy, like they have this like on again, off again friendship. At one point, Henrietta Maria um, presented a petition to her husband to get rid of Lucy, which is like very Tracy Flick of her. But Charles also did not um, take Lucy on as a lover, as far as we know. And eventually Henrietta Maria was like, okay, she stopped being quite so wildly jealous and she came to become fond of Lucy. And so, you know, this sort of was only good things for Lucy because being the best friend of the queen meant that she got to continue to be just like the gorgeous, most popular woman at court, um, inspiring yet more poets and musicians to write odes to her and to adore her. So we're going to get to the spy stuff real soon, but just bear in mind that like, this is just Lucy Hay living her life. Like she's just like so smart and so capable and so interesting. And she's not really given any outlet to use her talents except just like courtly intrigue. And she's being like the best at courtly intrigue. Like she's becoming best friends with the queen. She's sleeping with George Villiers. (laughs) She is with George Villiers and she's making a good deal out of it, even if that wasn't what she wanted to be doing. She's married to James Hay. Like she's doing well, but there's not a lot of opportunities for her to really show what she's made of basically because we've gotten past the gunpowder plot scenario but if you know your british history you know that we are inching ever closer to the whole oliver cromwell overthrowing the monarchy scenario but we need to take just a brief detour right now into the land of the three musketeers literally the book the three musketeers so Thanks super much, by the way, to my friend Annika for helping to explain this plot point to me, because basically what happens is there's a character in the Three Musketeers books called Milady de Winter, who is this amazing lady spy. And part of her story was inspired. Um, Alexandre Dumas, the author of the Three Musketeers, found some documents that are explaining some stuff about Lucy Hay. And so he took little pieces of that to make this badass character. Milady de Winter. And the main thing that he borrowed from Lucy's legend is a story that, because there's already a thing called the Affair of the Diamond Necklace, we can't call it that. Um, that's a past episode of this podcast. You can learn about that. That's the whole Jean de Lamont situation. Lucy and George Villiers are lovers, but George Villiers is not monogamous in his being lovers with her. He's also married to someone else. He's just like, overall scum of the earth, dirtbag guy. And he also had a huge crush on the French queen who is named Anne of Austria. And so Anne of Austria was into it. And so she gave George, this is where it gets a little confusing, a diamond necklace, I think. So the French king gave Anne of Austria this diamond necklace that was comprised of 12 jewels. And so in some translations, it calls it 12 studs. So some people think that they're talking about earrings, but I think they're talking about 
individual jewels on a necklace tied together with a ribbon because that is how jewelry was put together back then, apparently. So Anne of Austria, like George Villiers, she thought he was so good looking and he was, objectively speaking, even though inside he was just like a gross monster of a person. And so she gave him the diamond necklace her husband had given her. But I think that wasn't just like, here's a necklace, George, you can wear it. I think it was like, here's some diamonds, you can like whatever with them. I don't know, get money for them or something. Anyway, so this part is unclear to me as to what is true and what is just part of the Three Musketeers story. So I'm going to like exclude the whole Cardinal Richelieu of it all because I don't 100% understand what his dealings were in the actual real life story. But in the actual real life story, What happened is that, allegedly, Lucy was tasked with getting the diamonds back from George to return them to the queen so that the king wouldn't find out that the queen had given them to George. You might need to, like, diagram that out for yourself or something. So basically, Lucy, who is just, like, this kind of bored woman with, like, these amazing spy skills and nothing to do with them, She's like, takes on this job to steal these diamonds back from George. So it becomes this whole sort of like jewel thief scenario where Lucy needs to steal the diamonds back from George without him noticing and get them back to Anne of Austria so that her husband doesn't know that she's given them to George. It's all sort of like she needs to steal the diamonds from one place, bring them back to another place. And who knows if it happened or not, because this is the other thing about researching a woman in history. There's not always a lot written about them, but when you're researching a woman who's also a spy, who's really good at being a spy, a lot of what she did is extra not written down. She allegedly was able to return the diamonds back to the queen. And this was all a similar thing is a major plot point in the novel, The Three Musketeers, which was written like 200 years later. So Lucy's clearly keeping herself busy, what with her lover, potentially other lovers. I want that for her, but who knows? And then she becomes a widow in 1636. So she is aged basically 36 years old. And she is super rich because her husband had been super rich. And now she doesn't have, I mean, not that he was really cramping her style that much, but now not just men looking to be her lover, but people who wanted to maybe marry her were sort of rolling in. And this is where things are, um, like if we're doing a countdown to the whole overthrow of the British monarchy, like it's just getting closer and closer. Like all the little chess pieces are all coming in into the right places. So one of the men who became one of her lovers, allegedly, was a guy named Thomas Wentworth, who was part of the House of Parliament. And so everything was already pretty um, us or them vis-a-vis parliament at this point. Effectively, and this is not a part of history I've studied very much at all, but from what I understand, the royal family to this point in England had been very absolute monarchy. Like they got to decide everything and the parliament just kind of like stamped and was like, sure, that's great. But the parliament wanted more and more powers and the king wanted to not give them the powers. And so there were these two factions. So the people who supported the parliament and the people who supported the royal family. And so at this point, Thomas Wentworth, Lucy's latest lover, he had been pro-parliament and then he switched to pro-royals. And that's the other thing that makes this studying this situation confusing is people flip-flopped around quite a bit. But basically being pro-royal family became an increasingly unpopular way to be. And eventually Thomas was arrested and sentenced to death. Lucy kind of saw which way the wind was blowing. And so she just sort of delicately removed herself from the situation. Because if you remember what happened to her father, RIP, the wizard Earl, he died a bit ago, just living his life. Not gross in the same way as George Villiers, but also just like not great guy. Anyway, Lucy had seen how her father was sent to jail for 16 years just for being friends with somebody who did something possibly treasonous. So she wasn't going to let Thomas bring her down. So she sort of just like backtracked out of Thomas Wentworth's life is kind of like Thomas Wentworth. What? I don't, I don't know that man, etc. And then she took as her new lover, allegedly, I mean, her new, her new companion, alleged lover, 
is um, basically Thomas's arch enemy, who was a guy named John Pym, who was on the pro parliament side of things. And so at this point, like you're just like, she can't stop herself. And it's kind of amazing. So her career as a secret double agent slash spy kicks into high gear. She was sharing information from the king to Pym and the other parliamentarians. Um, at one point, crucially, she told the, them that the king was onto them and he's going to arrest them. And her warning them meant that they had time to escape. So that was sort of, keep that in mind later when we're talking about her significance. So her advance warning allowed them to escape. The English Civil War broke out in 1642 and the parliamentarians were against the royal family. And this was like literally a war in England. So Lucy at this point was very much caught in the middle of this whole situation because of her relationship with Pym and because of how she just helped him out. Like she, it seems like she was more on the parliamentary side than the royal side, but she kind of held her cards close to her chest. Like even, (laughs) even to this day, it's unclear, like literally to historians studying her now, like which side her allegiance was truly on. And I kind of think she was just team chaos. She just liked going back and forth and maybe didn't really have an allegiance either way. But basically, as the war progressed, the pro-parliament side, which she had been seemingly a member of for a while, like basically both sides thought she was on their side, pretending to be on the other side, but she was kind of on both sides kind of on neither sides. And I mean, she's doing stuff like she was writing letters. She was like housing people for secret meetings. She was like writing letters in code. She was using like invisible ink. Like she was, she was doing amazing stuff and she was like fully involved in the whole thing. And so part of why she was able to do as much as she was able to do, all the men were suspicious of all the other men and no one was really suspicious of the women. And Lucy was known for being clever and beautiful etc. But she was also sort of seen as this sort of like vain, sort of um, self-absorbed, selfish person. You know, this woman who wore the mask for so long when she had the smallpox scars and no one really took her seriously, which she used to her advantage, like all good ladies buys. Oliver Cromwell is this guy who, like King Charles I was taken, his head was chopped off. Oliver Cromwell became the new sort of head of England, but not the king. And his faction was just becoming more and more sort of like fanatically Puritan. And that was just not Lucy's style at all. And so she seems to have like fully decided at this point to become a spy for the team royals. And I totally forgot to mention that well before this was all happening, just FYI, like this is even before Lucy was widowed. George Villiers was in fact murdered by a disgruntled army officer. So if you're just wondering why he isn't in the story anymore, he basically was killed for being a horrible person. FYI. So English Civil War is happening. Lucy is doing stuff like she's raising funds for the royal family by selling jewelry. But she also took on a role as sort of a messenger between her, her frenemy, Queen Henrietta Maria, in exile and the royalists who supported their side. So with the king being dead, at this point. Oh, and side note, the children of Charles I were being raised by Lucy's sister, uh, Dorothy, for a while, because she was like a trusted person. So Dorothy is still, like I mentioned before, they were so close to each other, and they were, and there's not a lot of space in this podcast to get into that whole situation. There's another book I'll recommend to you that talks about that a bit more. But basically, Lucy, every time something tragic happened to her in her life, she had a, she gave birth to a child who died, She fell ill a number of times. She always went back to be with her sister, Dorothy. Like she and Dorothy were like super tight, super close. And Dorothy was sort of like keeping the home fires burning while Lucy was just running around being an amazing lady spy. Anyway, so about two months after Oliver Cromwell became the head of the New England, um, Lucy was arrested for her work, working for the royal family. And she was imprisoned in, guess where? Tower of London the same place where she had been held by her father when she was 18 years old. But now it wasn't, things were different now. She didn't have like a luxury apartment situation, not like when she was being mentored by Tits Out Frances Howard. She was just sort of there. It was depressing. It sucked. And she had had these health problems 
for a while, quote unquote, hypochondria, which could be so many various different health problems that can occur to a woman and being held in a shitty jail cell in this kind of stressful situation where you might be killed at any point didn't really help with her health problems. So even in there, even though she's have, having these health problems, um, she still toughed it out. She was interrogated, but she never gave up any information because she was tough as nails. She wrote secret letters in code back and forth with uh, the new, with Prince Charles, who was the kind of the figurehead for the royalist cause because King Charles I had been executed. His son, Prince Charles, was in exile. And so Lucy was communicating with him. She used her brother as an intermediary and some of the other guards as well because she was able to charm them. Even the jailers were, who were like, oh, we're totally Puritans. And Lucy was like, I'm also totally a Puritan. And they're like, we totally believe you. And she's like, can you take this blank piece of paper to this other person and in return, bring me back a blank piece of paper? And they did. And, but it was invisible ink. And you just like, like in Knives Out, you just put like flame behind it and you can read, read the letters. Is that a spoiler for Knives Out? Sorry. She was in jail for 18 shitty months, but she kept scheming even while she was in there. And she was released from prison basically on parole at the end of this. She was actually released to go and stay with her sister, Dorothy. The country was still under the control of the parliamentarians, but Lucy was at this point just seemingly, seemingly, I think, I don't know if she's a spy, but she seemed to be supporting the restoration of the monarchy. And so she became an, like, even though she just got out of the Tower of London where she'd been for 18 months and she was having like even worse symptoms, she wasn't able to do so much, you know, like in the field running around lady spy work, but she did a lot of work behind the scenes, um, helping arrange things for people, writing letters, etc. And she was instrumental in helping to eventually restore Prince Charles to the throne where he became King Charles II. So... On May 1660 was when the restoration of the monarchy officially happened. And then six months later, Lucy passed away, aged about 60 years old. To learn more about this whole situation, which there's so much I didn't have time to get into here, because this is just one little, little podcast, but just trust me, there's lots to know. So there is a book that is called Court Lady and Country Wife by Lita Rose Betjerman which is where I learned a bunch about Lucy and also her sister, Dorothy. And then the book about lady spies is called Invisible Agents, Women and Espionage in 17th Century Britain by Nadine Ackerman. So it's literally about women spies in 17th Century Britain. And it it talks about Lucy Hay quite a bit, obviously. And it's time to get into the scoring of it all. So Lucy Hay scandaliciousness. This is interesting. We've got the 18 years old going to get married. Her father keeps her in jail, mentored by tits out Francis Howard, gets married, takes a lover or is taken as a lover or somehow is able to co-use George Villiers and not be destroyed by him, but actually to use it to her advantage to spy on the queen then takes the two parliamentary lovers. Her scandaliciousness is pretty high, I have to say. I'm going to give her, I think, a seven. Her scandaliciousness, her scheminess, flat out 10. I mean, she hatched even more schemes than we'll ever know about because she was so good at them. She was a spy and we'll never find out what she did because she was so good at it. I mean, she like all of her schemes, like at first it was just sort of like high schoolish stuff, just like scheming about like who will be her lover or like spying on the queen and stuff and just like wearing the best outfits, etc. I want to mention also, I, in part of my research, I found out that during, in around 1620, there was a fashion craze of women dressing sort of masculine to the point where some women even like chopped off their hair in sort of like a 1920s moment, like a bob moment. Like they were wearing like leather, like to the elbow sort of like workman's gloves with her dresses and Lucy Hay was all over it. Anyway, she was amazing. Style is not one of the things, but anyway, her scheminess was unsurpassed. I think she had countless numbers of schemes and it seems like they're all amazing. Significance. Like all good spies, we don't know exactly how many 
things she did. We do know that she passed along that message to Pym that made it so that he, so the parliamentarians weren't arrested by the king, which ultimately isn't what she wanted because she seemed to switch sides to the royalists. But if she hadn't passed along that message, the royalists could have been stopped. And then the whole Oliver Cromwell situation might not have happened, which was like a pretty substantially important thing that happened in English history. At the same time, she wasn't like the queen of a country who like took over another country or something. But the significance, I think we don't know exactly what she did, but the behind the scenes significance feels pretty high to me. I'm going to give her a six for significance. And then the last category is the sexism, quote unquote, bonus, or how much did being a woman hold her back? And this is like similar to some of the other women we've looked at. I feel like she saw that she's living in this misogynistic, patriarchal culture. And she was like, okay, this is what's going on. And I am going to find a way to like lean into this and twist it around and use it to my advantage. Like she's sort of like a Scarlet Pimpernel situation where if she just like played up the fact that she was this sort of like vapid, silly person, nobody would suspect she was secretly this amazing spy. So it's almost like she used sexism to her advantage. I don't know if it was a detriment to her, except for the whole father putting her in jail thing. Hmm. When the whole George Villiers potentially forcing her to be his mistress. I am going to give her a five for the sexism bonus. So the total then, this looks pretty good for her. Um, let me see, 17. 28 is her score, which actually is the second highest score of the whole season. Elizabeth Bathory got 29, Lucy Hay 28, uh, Jean de Lamotte 27, Frances Howard 26, and then Carolina Brunswick and Mary Toft both tied at a 20. These have been some scandalous stories we've been looking at this season. So I want to let you know that this is the sixth and final episode of season one of Vulgar History, but don't be sad because season one, like season one, the theme was will behave women don't make history podcasts. There is going to be season two, numerous more seasons after that, each with their own fun theme, but we're going to take a little break now for the holidays but I do have some announcements to give you, including the fact that um, if you join the Patreon, I'm going to be doing, I think, between now and the next, now in season two, I'm going to be posting some mini episodes. And so they're going to be called, I think they're going to be called, so this asshole, and they're going to be sort of like five, 10 minutes, just looking at some of the assholes from some of the stories that we've been looking at this season. For instance, from this one, it'll be like a little look at George Villiers, monster human, maybe also looking at the wizard Earl. What was his deal? If we're looking back at some other episodes, Nathaniel St. Andre, thirsty bitch who lived for drama. Basically, there's going to be short episodes because I'm not, I'm not a men's historian. There's lots of people who do that. I'm a women's historian. But some of these assholes, like... Just explaining kind of what their deal was, I think, sort of helps fill out the story of these women and what they were up against. But the women, they get the full hour episodes. So this asshole, five, 10 minutes, um, mini episodes. And so you can find my Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash Ann Foster Writer. Um, there's other places where you can find us. So Vulgar History is on Instagram. We are on Twitter. Both of them are at Vulgar History or Vulgar History Pod. This podcast is now on, I think, most of the podcast apps. So it would be awesome if you could subscribe and rate and review, as people say, on other podcasts. And I'm going to be working on the mini episodes. I'm going to be finalizing plans for season two coming up pretty soon. So if you follow me on social media or on the Patreon, you can get updates on that sort of stuff. I also do lots of writing. You can find my writing at annfosterwriter.com. And then I've also made some merch. Um, I made a, a different product for each episode this season. The one for the uh, Lucy Hay episode is just a picture of her. And then just sort of covering her eyes, it says, lady spy, because she was just an amazing lady spy. And I love the fact that we'll never truly know everything about her because she was a good lady spy. Uh, this is Vulgar History. And my name is Ann Foster. And I'll see you for season two. 
That is the saga of Lucy Percy. And I'm going to let you know, because I promised I would, tell you some super secret sexy hints about what the next season is going to be. I can't say exactly when it's going to start. Like I'm, I've been on a little hiatus and then I'm getting back into it. There's going to be, I told you it's going to be at least 20 episodes. I've told you before it's going to, it takes place in the 18th century, all kinds of different countries, all different parts of the world and how they interact with each other. Cause that was a time in world history where people are traveling more between different places. So there's a lot of countries to talk about and I'm excited. There will be spies in this season that's coming up and um, it's going to be coming in probably, I'm going to guess like spring, late spring, because my hope and plan for the next upcoming season, which I'm just getting into like super research mode for now, is that I want to get everything prepared ahead of time so that when I do the season, I can just straight through do like 20 episodes or 25 episodes or whatever it is without little breaks in between. Or if I do little breaks, maybe I'll do sort of like here's sort of a part one of the season, take a little break of, you know, like author interviews or whatever, which is not a break for you. It's just that means I don't need to be researching every week, which I need for my own sanity. Anyway, so coming out in the spring, I will say, vulgar history, the next season, 18th century, worldwide, Mr. Worldwide, Pitbull, um, shout out to Pitbull. So a couple things I'm going to say, which is you can get in touch with me about anything you want to get in touch with me about. I value our parasocial relationship. My DMs are open at Vulgar History Pod on Instagram. I also have an email account, which is Vulgar History Pod at gmail.com, or there's a contact form on the website, vulgarhistory.com. Also, if you go to the website, vulgarhistory.com, that's where we have transcripts of recent episodes. Thank you to Evelyn Malik from The Wordery, who provides these transcripts. Just so you know, behind the scenes, like she, like, in a lot of these episodes where I say words, and not not even words in like non-English languages, often in the English language, where it's just like a name or whatever. It's like this person, aka this. And she's just like, what's the spelling of this name? Like she does her best to figure out the spellings of names, but a lot of like, gives me a lot of information from, you know, books or whatever. It's not just stuff you can easily find on Wikipedia or Google to fact check. So anyway, I appreciate her diligence. Thank you, Evelyn. And we have merchandise available at vulgarhistory.com slash store, or if you're outside the U.S., I recommend our alternate store, which is vulgarhistory.redbubble.com because the shipping is a bit better there for international type people. And you can also support the podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash Anna Foster Writer, where for $1 a month, you get early ad-free access to all of the episodes and also every access to all previous episodes. <laughs> so you can listen to those there. And when you get that, by the way, it used to be you had to listen to them on patreon.com itself from the Patreon app, but now you can sync that up to your Spotify or your Apple podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can just listen to it like normal, but just without those ad breaks in the middle. For $5 or more a month, pledge to me on patreon.com, you get access to all the bonus past and future episodes of my bonus episodes of Velgo Peace Theater. Um, where I talk about costume dramas with Alison Epstein and Lana Wood Johnson. We will be talking about Mary and George, the thing about George Villiers and gay King James, because I'm excited that's there. And I'm going to be looking in every crowd scene to be like, is Francis Howard there? Is Lucy Hay around? Anyway, I also do bonus episodes of So This Asshole, where I talk about shitty men, for instance, George Villiers, and also King James. And then also sometimes I have the after show, which is where I'm talking to somebody and there's kind of off topic stuff I want to get into. Anyway, that's all on Patreon as well. There's some episodes coming up this next block, like new episodes start next week, y'all. And I'm going to have some guests and some of the guests I'm going to be keeping after hours. I should call Vulgar History After Dark instead of the after show. I call it the after show in memory of the Hills after show. Millennials know what I'm talking about. Anyway, there's some people who are excited to talk about non-podcast stuff. And that's another strategy I have for this year for the new upcoming episodes, which is to try and focus the podcast on podcasty stuff. And if I want to just like kiki with a guest, put that into the after show so that people can know what you're going to be getting when you listen to whatever you're listening to. Anyway, yeah, next week, new content coming out, new, exciting people to talk to. Sometimes it's going to be me doing talking and I'm excited for you to hear all the stuff that I've planned coming up in the next couple months. And behind the scenes, I'm working on the super secret really exciting next season it's not like international part two it's like a combination of international in terms of just 
looking at different countries and different places, which is part of why the research I really want to, I need the time to do it properly because I'm learning about the history of like all these countries I've never researched before or been to or know about. I might be putting call outs on in the discord group or on my Instagram stories, just being like, is anyone from this country? Like, can you help me with pronunciation or whatever? Um, anyway, so stay vigilant. So it's going to be a combination of the international stuff, but with a really focused thesis. Like we're doing this stuff, I, I keep saying like the 18th century, but that's kind of where we are. But it's all centered around one person and kind of the effect of that person in all these different places. So in that way, it's kind of a combination of international with like the Mary Queen of Scots season or the Lady Jane Grey season. And I think it's going to work really well. And I'm really excited about it, but it's just going to take a lot of work. But anyway, thank you for listening. And oh, if you want to, you can leave reviews of this podcast is a nice thing you can do. Um, on Apple Podcasts, you can leave a nice little five-star review. On Spotify, you can leave you can leave a star rating, like five stars. And also per episode, like you can leave a little comment on a specific episode if you have thoughts about one episode or you just want to say something nice. Thank you so much for being the Tits Up Brigade. Looking forward to a whole new run of episodes with you to talk about you, to kiki about on Instagram and in Discord. And so I'll see you here next week. And until then, keep your pants on and your titties out. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Anne Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready, for a great evil is coming, and death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. With your long forgotten name, we call upon you. We call upon you. In the words of the unspeakable language, we call upon you. We call upon you. By the spilt blood of the wicked who walk upon this world, sprouting the words of false idols, we call upon you. We call upon you. On the land of the dead harvest, that which brings the earth itself into your service, Yamal, we call upon you. We call upon you. We call upon you. We call upon you. The Sprouting, a Call of Cthulhu actual play podcast by Blighthouse Studio. Find us on your podcatcher of choice.